so what I thought we could do is begin with a guided meditation. So it'll be just for 20 minutes or so to get us in the mood. And after that, Venerable Upeka has kindly offered to give us a little Dhamma reflection to get you even more in the mood. And then we'll have a little break and then some discussion among ourselves and also in the group. And uh, hopefully we can inspire you to get more involved in the project and more involved with this community and actually turn up in person someday. So uh, let's begin by just settling into our bodies and really relaxing and allowing ourselves to experience some inspiration and joy. And just gently landing in our bodies. Feeling our connection with the ground, supporting our body. Or maybe if you're sitting in a chair or on a sofa, you can feel that connection of your feet touching the ground. And recollecting that this is how the Buddha himself felt. This is how he was seated, feeling that connection with the ground. On the night of his enlightenment, under the Bodhi tree, allowing himself to be comfortable, he collected some grass and made a little cushion there between the roots of the Bodhi tree. So see if you too can give your body the maximum possible comfort as a gesture of compassion and goodwill towards this body, this vehicle that you have to practice the Dhamma and take profound steps towards your full liberation. Just as the Buddha may have thought many times along the way that the journey was tough. The difference there is he never gave up. Just as the Buddha can purify his mind, so can we, each one of us. So coming together as disciples of the Buddha. People for whom the Buddha taught the Dhamma for so many years. He taught the Dhamma knowing there'd be people today who are hungry for the taste of the Dhamma. Who are able and ready to look for that peace inside the mind. So feeling that sense of belonging to this beautiful community of practitioners worldwide, practicing the Buddha's bidding by simply being present and being kind. And to begin, once you've established a sense of kindness and awareness, kindfulness in your body, just bringing up some quality that you really appreciate and respect, recognize inside your own heart. Perhaps a quality 
that relates to an awakened mind. Something you're cultivating, something you really hold high. Perhaps you've touched into a sense of compassion at various times in your life. Perhaps you deeply revere honesty, truth. Perhaps you're trying to develop more patience, forgiveness to those who you live with or work with. Perhaps you try to understand why people behave the way they do. Just recognizing the seeds of these qualities, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, that you've been nurturing and respecting, developing in your heart. And allow yourself to feel glad to feel happy, to feel inspired that you too are on the path. You too have those seeds of enlightenment that you're watering right now simply by bringing them up. And however much ease, peace, presence you have right now, however much joy, well-being, see if you can develop contentment with that. Like the Buddha wanting for nothing, completely satisfied and at peace. being content with whatever feelings arise in your body, being content with the silence, all the thoughts that flow through your mind, the various emotions that may be passing through, Just nature doing its thing. Allowing everything just to be. Trusting in your own goodness, your own capacity for awakening. By establishing this beautiful attitude of contentment towards whatever's arising right now.
And just noticing how you feel right now. Whether there's a little bit more peace and contentment than when you began. And really valuing that. Valuing the beauty, the goodness in your heart. And recognizing that all beings have this same potential to find peace. Recognizing that in this room, the room where we're sitting in this monastery with several spiritual friends and this beautiful virtual Zoom room that spans across the globe. All these people have so many qualities, so much goodness, so much nobility. Something we can really respect. And just sharing our good wishes with everyone here. May we all continue to develop in the Dhamma for the good and benefit of so many beings. May we all be happy, truly content. May we all find peace. May all our suffering end. And spreading this thought to all beings everywhere, perhaps particular beings that come to mind, perhaps other beings In various parts of the world, some celebrating with us, celebrating Vesak, the Buddha's enlightenment, and some far away from the Dhamma, suffering in various ways. May all beings find peace, find safety, find freedom from fear. May all beings remember the goodness in their hearts and have the conditions and opportunities to develop them. So with these loving thoughts in mind, I'm going to ring the bell, but when I do so, just see if you can gradually come out of the meditation, but staying connected to any peace, any well-being inside. Staying embodied, present and connected as spiritual friends. I don't know if you can actually hear the bell. (laughs) No. I'll see if I can change the sound. No, it doesn't give me the button. That was a dong. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Just a little meditation. But it, honestly, if you're getting into the meditation and if you want to deepen it further, you can now listen to the Dhamma in a meditative way. That way it tends to go into the heart and uplift the heart and you can feel the effects of the Dhamma being shared. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, invite Venerable Upeka, who's right beside me. <laughs> to share some thoughts and reflections and maybe some personal 
stories with you all. So it's always very interesting to hear people's journeys to the Dhamma. And uh, yeah, I'm really delighted that she's agreed to do this today. So um, she'll give a little reflection for about 25 minutes or so. So thank you, Venerable. <laughs> Ah, someone wants to request the Dhamma talk. Mm -hmm. I guess you can. Should we unmute Vandana? She'd like to request it. Yeah, I, uh, yesterday I learned the Pali chant for requesting yeah. this. So yeah. I thought I should give, a, give it a try today. Great. Can I? Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Let me bring my... <laughs> <laughs> ब्रह्माचिलोकाधिपति सहमपति कतंजलियानाधिवरम मया कथा संदीधत संति धसता परजखा जाति का देशे तू धम्मम अनुकम भीमम पजम साधु 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 You brought tears to my eyes. <laughs> I don't know about everyone else, but thank you for your willingness to give it a go. That was so beautiful. And the last words that she was saying were out of compassion, out of anukampa. She's requesting the Dhamma talk today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, yeah, I have, I have to begin with, um, um, I was reflecting while when we, Chanda was, uh, uh, um, doing the guided meditation that you know we are I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants that um, that so many for so many thousands of years the um, sort of the the flame of the Dhamma Okay. Anyway. Yeah, the, the flame of the Dhamma has been carried by just with such great, sometimes great difficulty. And because, because it is just worth carrying. Yeah. What a way to start a Dhamma talk. Anyway. <laughs> Yes. So I think of all the um the um the many monks and nuns quite often who have taken the Dhamma from country to country uh, to this country, you know, like um Ajahn Chah coming in the 70s to the UK with a band of uh, weird of Western monks and how much uh, it has uh, uh, changed since then. Actually, when I was about 13, when I, we, I, I was living in New Zealand at that time, and that was a time that Buddhism was just becoming a thing. This was in the early uh, 80s and mid 80s. It was just becoming a thing in the West. And I was the only Buddhist. I was the only Buddhist in school. <laughs> and um, trying to uh, we used to have little Dhamma talks in the monks from Wellington used to come to our, uh, our hometown in New Zealand, which is a four hour drive. It was a big deal. And we didn't have computers at that time. Um, but my uh, my family, my mom, my brother, my me, my dad, our friends, trying to organize a Buddhist talk when nobody know, knew what a Buddhist was. <laughs> So how far we have come and how far this uh, flame of the Dhamma is just being carried by 
just because it is worthwhile, just because it is just, you know, it has to be spread. Um, yeah, so I just had to, I had to share that because I feel, you know, I'm just, um, who am I to give a Dhamma talk was my first thing. Who am I to give a Dhamma talk? But I'm just, you know, the standing on the shoulders of giants and uh, spreading something that is worth spreading. Anyway, I had a talk planned, but That's this great. came out. <laughs> so I was, I was reflecting on... Um, you know, what does Vesak mean? And what does Vesak mean to in this modern age? And, um, you know, why do we celebrate Vesak? How come there are so how many 40, 50, 60 people here remembering the birth of the Buddha? Uh, what does it mean to be um, a, a, a Buddhist, if you call yourself a Buddhist in this day and age? And when, when I was young, what a Buddhist meant was going to the temple, bowing in front of the Buddha, chanting things that I absolutely did not understand, <laughs> wearing white, and um, going home afterwards and knowing, what the heck did I do? You know, I just do it because that's what you do. Um, but um, is that what it means to be celebrating Vesak? Is that what it means to be a Buddhist? Does it mean, you know, going to the temple and bowing? But obviously that is not what what uh, Buddhism means to you. But yet we do celebrate Vesak, yet we do come here. And um, what is it that uh, makes us want to, to, to remember the birth of the Buddha, to remember this, you know, this, this, this day, 2,500 years later? So I, I uh, know for a lot of people, they come to Buddhism because they want to improve their lives. They want to, uh, it's meditation. It's often, you know, just um, re relaxing. It's learning how to deal with our minds. And that is, that is, uh, that's where we start. And that's um, where, in a way, uh, what is uh, attractive about Buddhism, because we don't come to it as a, um, kind of a a dogma a ritual a, a sort of a um, blind belief that's precisely why we like the dhamma but at the same time this th there is some that there is some element of you know um this beauty that comes from um faith is not a word apparently that gels with people but just a love of the Dhamma, a love and a confidence in this in this teaching. And that's why we celebrate Vesak. So I was reflecting, you know, how did I come to love the Dhamma? How did I come to be in robes? How did I come to be living in this country? You know, <laughs> of all places, why here? Anyway, we don't ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Not your S>. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, and uh, how and and when Chanda says it's nice to have stories, so I thought I'd tell you the story of how I ended. How I have so much love and uh, devotion to the to the Dhamma, and perhaps it might resonate for you. But um, so anyway, being a Buddhist by birth, being Sri Lankan, um, we used to you know go to the temple and. Uh, Chant itipiso bhagava arahang samha sambuddha, not knowing what the heck it was, chanting these qualities of the Buddha, and uh, you know, um, just just having no sense of understanding or um, uh, you know context of what 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 it means to love the Buddha, but it really was when I was about. I was 30, actually. It was my 30th birthday. And I thought, that's it. I'm old. <laughs> I've got to work. I've got to. I, I was married. So never mind marriage. But I've got to go on a retreat. I've got to work this thing out. 
So uh, when I was 30, my 30th birthday, I spent at the meditation center behind our the house that we lived in in Malaysia. Um, my, in fact, I... My husband at that time also thought it was a great idea to go on a three-month retreat. So both of us packed up our house, packed up our beds, and ended up in Malaysia. It ended up in a retreat center in Malaysia for three months, which ended up a much longer story because he ordained, I ordained. Anyway, the story goes on. Um, but it was really during that first retreat that first long retreat that um, it was a Mahasi style retreat. It was a uh, you know, in the Bur in the Burmese tradition, and there was just you know a, just the loveliest side of who was kind of like a father in the end, guy who was the teacher and the guide there. Um, yes, and so sitting all those hours of walking, sitting, walking, sitting, month, week after week, month after month, and you know somewhere along the line, the Dhamma. A little, a little spark goes off and you go, oh my goodness, I'm creating this whole thing. I'm creating my world. It's my thoughts. These are just thoughts. And so all of a sudden, what you have been listening, reading, you know, reciting for, you know, for decades, all of a sudden, um, it starts to make sense and it starts to be obvious. Isn't that obvious? Yes, of course. Of course, it's just, it's just I, I'm seeing something. I, I don't like it. I react. It's so obvious. And so a little bit of the Dhamma starts to make sense. It, you kind of go like, of course. And so coming out of retreat, you know, you, you go back to, you, you open the suttas, you open a book of the word with those words and you go, you read it a bit and go, heck, this isn't complicated. <laughs> this is what, this, this is, this is, this applies to what I'm doing. And this is definitely something I understand. And so all of a sudden the Dhamma came alive. The Dhamma was no longer something that I just parroted. It was something that was like relevant and it was something that was, um, in fact, um, I could do, even me, even I could do. And so as you, uh, you know, look into a little bit more, and I was fortunate enough, at, um, we went to Burma after that, our uh, Sayadaw. He, he he sort of uh, managed us going to a, to, to a retreat in Burma, which ended up two years later and then when we good, the Rakita ordained, I ordained, and anyway. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, yes, going further into the practice, further into spending time in meditation, that you, the more and more, the whole thing just starts to be so real. It isn't magic, it's just the truth. And you're kind of going, oh, why didn't I see it all this time? And um, and so that's for me was where where the faith in the Dhamma started to arise, and then from that from that seeing it, you kind of go like, my goodness, I am so lucky, I am so lucky to get this because I, life was so confusing. You know, I was trying so hard to be happy. I was trying to be the right person, do the right thing, get the right job, say the right thing. And it still wasn't working out. So finally, to hear the Dhamma and know that it's never going to work out. You're, you're not ever going to be the perfect person. And you're not ever going to, you know, it's not by being somebody. It's not by um, you know, trying, 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 trying to become perfect. That's not the road. It's never going to, you're never going to be perfect. So for me, that was like the, uh, the rising of faith, rising of confidence in this teaching. Thank God the Dhamma is there. Sorry, not God, but <laughs> thank goodness. Thank goodness for the Dhamma. Thank goodness for um, that someone has kept this 
alive for 2,500 years that, that we have this, that, you know, I can be relieved of this confusion of things just not making any sense. Um, yeah. So I, I, oh, I have another 10 minutes. <laughs> right. So I just thought I'd ref um, uh, just talk a little bit more about um, how, what it is to have faith in or confidence in the Buddha himself, because today, after all, is the day that we, we remember the birth of the Buddha also very conveniently, his enlightenment and his passing away. I mean, how awesome is that? <laughs> um, but uh, how do we, how do we sort of connect to, and why do we connect to this person? You know, I, I found it uh, difficult in the beginning as well, you know, he just had a lump on his head. He's <laughs> made of cement and sat at the sat at the front of a hall. I mean, <laughs> but uh, after uh, reading the suttas and after, um, you know, just um, yeah, after seeing a spark of what he was trying to say, you realize, wow, the Buddha. He was. He was not a savior. He was not a god. That I'm. I'm want to revere he's just someone who is he's he recognized he's a doctor he recognized a problem a problem that all of us have which is that life just doesn't work out and he found an amazing solution so he's not a, he's not a historic he's not like a god he's just a a human being just like me someone who was who had the same problems, the same suffering, the same complications, someone just like me who has this capacity to awaken. So, so you know, I can do it too. <laughs> and so when I bring up these qualities of the Buddha, I also, it's like, it's like when you rec when you when you see someone who or you think of someone who has these qualities it wakes it up in you as well when i see um a, a beautiful someone behaving beautifully something in you awakens when i see ajahn brahm you know just for a few second few minutes you kind of go like wow what was that about and it wakes up something in you something in you knows i recognize that there's something I know about that. So it's the same when I think of the Buddha, I kind of go, I recognize that. And it wakes up something in me. It wakes up that awakened nature that I know. I just haven't, I just haven't quite worked it out, but it's there. So um, reflecting on the Buddha or well, reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, reflecting on just the 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 you know, a memory of a Buddha just brings up those qualities in ourselves. So um, I don't know if I should go through the qualities of the Buddha that we chant all the time, or I, I'll go on, on to the qualities of the Dhamma, which actually I relate to more. And um, so... Again, I, I don't know if you know, as, as Buddhists, we, one thing we of, always do is recollect the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And um, the qualities of the Dhamma, and this is, uh, uh, how, that is, this is what is recited all the time, it is, is Sandittiko. So Sandittiko, as, how, how does the whole thing go? No, Supertipano Bhagavato Savaka. No. Svakato Bhagavato Dhamma. Yeah, Svakato Bhagavata Dhamma. Sandittiko. Sakvato Bhagavata. Sandittiko. Akaliko. Ehipasiko. Opanaiko. Pachatang Veditabo. Vinyo Hiti. So those are the qualities of the Dhamma that. Uh, 
are recited uh, traditionally for um, when you recollect the the Dhamma. And uh, so I'll start Sandittiko, Swata, Swakato Bhagota Sandittiko. Sandittiko means that the teaching is can be Sandittiko realized in this very life, Sandittiko. So what does this mean, Sandittiko? It means that it is not something that happens when you go to heaven. It's not something that you're holding out for uh, 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 to happen, you know, when you die. It's not, if I really suffer right now, <laughs> I'll get I'll get paid paid in you know, paid after death. It's something that you see here and now when you're able to let go, when you're able to um, um, give up your sense of self a little bit. You see the re results. You see yourself relax. You see yourself happier. You you see yourself at ease in the world. So the Dhamma is sandittiko, apparent here and now. Akaliko, it's timeless or immediately effective. Akaliko, it is um, akaliko timeless. It could mean that throughout, um, regardless of of you know, two thousand five hundred years ago, five thousand years ago, it's always true. It's always true, and it's. Um, um yeah okay. we're back we're back hopefully we'll be back for a while but time has no meaning okay so who knows so yeah. maybe a couple of moments to wind up right right so i'll just uh continue and just finish the last two qualities of the dhamma ehipasiko openaiko is leading to liberation it leads in the right di direction it leads in the direction of nibbana and pachatang vedita bo vinyo hiti is that it can it is something that each one of us can see for ourselves so with that extra <laughs> little break i will wind up and uh um, hopefully that you also have some kind of way of connecting to the qualities of the Dhamma and the qualities of the Buddha and the qualities of the Sangha, because that element of faith and that element of confidence, it just makes you go beyond your your little world view, it opens your heart. Maybe there is another possibility. Let me just trust. Let me just see if it works. Let go of what I think it is. And, and the Dhamma, I mean, faith is one of, the, one of the five great faculties, for one of the Indriyas. So I hope that has helped you to perhaps gain, reflect on the qualities of the Buddha, gain some um, confidence and help you to Love the Dhamma and see the Dhamma for yourself. Sad, sad, sad. Okay, thank you very much. That was really inspiring, especially with the like dramatic pause. That was like that just kind of built up to the conclusion and <laughs> gave us a moment to notice our own reactions and responses. So, very wonderful and uplifting talk. Thank you, Ben. And uh, I think it's a great way to start, actually, with a bit of emotion. It makes it real. It opens the heart, doesn't it? And isn't that really what it's all about, just opening the heart? Not just kind of adding more stuff into the head, but just opening ourselves to the truth and to the truth of what we experience at any given moment. So we thought we would have a little break now because it is uh, a two-hour session. So we don't want to make this break. Um, cause you to disappear for long so let's just leave our videos going you can close your video if you want but don't leave the room um, and just have a quick toilet break what do they call it now a comfort break um, but it usually means water in or water out so <laughs> you can water yourselves 
however you need to. And we'll see you back at five, exactly five. And then we'll have some discussion among ourselves so you can meet each other and it will be really beautiful. And then we can mm -hmm. talk together as well. Okay, so we'll just mute ourselves and perhaps turn off our screen and we'll be back promptly at five. See you very soon. Okay. We had a really lovely, we had more people, fair enough. We had a really lovely chat amongst ourselves. And yeah, mm -hmm. one of the things that came up for us was um, the importance of spiritual friendship, the people around mm -hmm. us who understand this path and who can give us confidence and um, understanding about uh, the natural kind of inclination that we start to develop to renounce, for example, you know, it's very much against the, the way of the world. And, uh, you know, we can feel that that's a bit scary, actually, if it's not happening to others. But if we have spiritual friendship and community, then it starts to feel a little more uh, uh, possible and, I guess, less scary. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I have to say, I feel very grateful that I came across the Dhamma in India and uh, in a place that it was understood and with a lot of time and no return ticket back. <laughs> so the ability to keep on exploring the path. So uh, yeah, nice to see some comments. Please do feel free to leave any comments about your experience there in the groups. And uh, I hope that most of you are still with us. I think it's still quite a big group. So it'd be lovely to um, just hear any reflections of things that were said, if anybody would like to um, just relate something that stood out perhaps for you. Uh, we won't be able to get to everybody and we'll have to keep it pretty short. So just a few words so that we have uh, time for some Q&A and uh, discussion about the project as well. So I'm coming to Joseph. Hi. All the way from Canada. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable. Um, in our group, I wanted to, sh you, you've mentioned the, the Dhamma uh, and you mentioned opening your heart. So I wanted to use this book as a symbol of Dhamma and open the heart <laughs> and, and share a story from uh, uh, our group uh, that inspires confidence. And it's a, it's a story of my, of an experience I had with Ajahn Brahm that I wanted to offer the community as a gift of goodwill and to inspire confidence. So we were talking about um, the novice ordination. There was a new, recent novice ordination while I was there. And uh, Ajahn Brahm was offered tea and flowers while this new Samanera was being surrounded by a huge lay community offering him gifts and praise and, and well wishes. And I turned over to look at Ajahn Brahm and he had taken a, a little pink rose that he had been offered and he had dipped it in his tea and he started blessing people with it. <laughs> and and it was, tea and was holy. <laughs> just like that, just like blessing people. And it was like a holy water rose. And that's mm -hmm. just when it, it was, it, it felt like recollection of the Sangha, worthy of gifts, mm -hmm. you know, like when someone's kind like that and they're worthy of gifts and you offer them gifts, and you feel the warmth and the brightness in the heart it's that confidence rises naturally thank you thank you yes absolutely mm -hmm. seeing the dhamma embodied and lived mm -hmm. anyone else like to share you're also welcome to share difficulties places that you're stuck or that people tend to get stuck mm -hmm. that's also fine and it also doesn't have to be about the subject so anything people would like to share or ask questions on now is your chance is that richard mm. where yes um yes hi when um so uh -huh. basically i uh, sort of you know so, uh, sort of sort of blow so about this um as, as of reflecting the little group it, 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 I was reflecting in the little mini group about, about you know, about our, you know, about, you know, about our understanding of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, what it means to us. So, I, you know, I said in the group that I, every evening, I found um, the last couple of months, I actually I like to recite the Vatana Sutta mm -hmm. every evening. I find that really, really nice. And sometimes it really makes me literally burst into tears. I literally sit there weeping 
and I can't help myself. It's really weird. It's just it's only certain. It could be any one of the senses to sit there, and like something you know really sort of resonates. It could be any one of them whatsoever, and um, it sort of really seems to resonate very deeply with me. So I find that very good. So that really some um, you know that particular sutta I find very good. It, you know, it's yeah. very simple. It's very direct, and it explains the highest qualities of Buddha Dhamma Sangha. It does indeed. So Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. It's one of my very favourite suttas. Um, maybe Matthias can write that in the chat. I'm pretty sure he knows. Ratana, just uh, pronounced like it's spelled, spelled like it's pronounced. And it goes through the qualities of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha in a very beautiful way. Yeah. And try and get hold of the English translation. It's really special. Yeah. And someone else says, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to meet others, <clears throat> to hear their voices, and to share our thoughts and practices. Super. And coming to Vandana. You call again from America, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm in California. So I, I got this opportunity to in the room with Christine, Robin, and Reagan. And they all are from Europe, I guess. Yeah, if I understood them correctly. So I was really um, uh, inspired to hear their journey in the Dhamma. And uh, one of them said about uh, they were going through psychotherapy and uh, uh, it was so expensive. And when they met with the Dhamma, <laughs> everything was offered for free and the even beneficial for their particular obstacles and the issues they were going through. I think the same uh, issue we discussed earlier also, I think yesterday or day before, <laughs> some some other time <laughs> gathering, yeah, that how the these psychotherapies are, of course, becoming popular because of so many people going through mental issues. And uh, this that, that can be helpful in one way, but not dealing with the root which is, uh, which is that's why you keep going back to them, spending a lot of money. So uh, I, I really wish and hope that people find the Dhamma and get all their question answered, because that's what I said to them, that there is no problem out there which Buddha cannot answer. So just have to be have some patience, and then you will find the fruit of the Dhamma and just meditate. Every single day, listen to the talks, get inspired, get motivated every single day, and you are you are on the right path. So, thank you, Venerable Chanda, for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your comment. I just like to say that whilst I fully agree that the Buddha's teaching gets to the root of the matter, the greed, hatred, and delusion, ideally. I do think it's important that we're in a balanced state of mind, that we actually do address mental health issues as we would physical diseases, um, to be really able to absorb the teachings most effectively, because sometimes there are genuine um, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Dhamma is not sometimes specific enough to go into the, the exact causes there. And sometimes it can be so helpful to speak to another person and someone who really understands the patterns, because they're just patterns, you know, patterns of thinking, patterns of behavior. And sometimes also, um, uh, what do you call it, when the chemistry, the brain chemistry, the actual, um, yeah, that can be a chemical element to things like depression, et cetera. So it's not to say that we shouldn't continue taking medication, especially if you have um, things like, say, paranoid schizophrenia or something like this. If it's helping you, it's not a sign that you're not a good practitioner. In fact, it's a sign that you're dealing with multiple causes and that will mm. have most effect, I think. So, yeah, the Buddha definitely goes to the root cause and eventually, in a sense, in a sense, the Buddha's teaching and the path of meditation is a higher training. Mm. You know, there's a lot that comes first. So we need to uh, work with our sila, with our livelihood. And livelihood doesn't, doesn't just include what we do. I think it also includes our ability to... Um, um, contribute in a meaningful way. So when we think about taking candidates for training, for example, we want to see that they're able to um, function well in the world. You know, they're kind of integrated enough in their practice and in their relationships, etc. that they've done a lot of that uh, work to be not perfect by any means, but 
an invisible sort of state of um, stability to then start undermining, in a way, all that that we take to be a self. Because that can be a scary path, you know. It can be a scary path if there's not quite a healthy sense of self, first of all. It can be a little bit destabilizing. So I think those foundations are really important too. But yeah, the Buddha did teach actually an eightfold path. So it is included there in that sense. I completely agree with you. But I just wanted to put that little uh, that little caveat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else from the room? I'm sure there'll be lots of comments. Filippo is there. Is he going to ask something or is it your dad? <laughs> you can if you want. He's so shy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Hello. Don't worry, I won't force you. <laughs> Hi, Sean. Um, yes, no, um, it was our, our discussion group. Of, well, one thing I said that then other people said they felt the same was in terms of was well, quite reassuring. I don't know, I don't know if it's the right word, reassuring, but it's or well, even nice to know. But some of the, you know, the when I said the obstacles that I find being busy. Uh, trying to do too much, trying too hard, and um, that's where I, I find I have obstacles. And and they said, some other people said, yes, I'm the same, and, you know, I haven't maybe practised as much as I want to recently, and it's like, oh, maybe I'm not so bad as I sort of thought. <laughs> and, and, and again, just having this these talks, speaking to people, and having good friendship, um, being around good people and people that practise, um, yeah, it's really uplifting and inspiring uh, and just yeah it just really helps doesn't it and and venerable pekka pekka said in her talk earlier about trying to be perfect um and trying too hard and actually it's just we're okay and just even just those words just really resonated and just even thing hearing things like that yeah so that's it. thank you <laughs> Brilliant. yeah it's funny, isn't it, that we it takes a lot for us to realize we're okay or we're good enough when we're actually more than good enough. <laughs> yeah. Anna. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Lovely to see you at last. <laughs> I know I wasn't much recently around, but uh, yeah, it's going to change a bit. Good, good. Um, yeah. Um I was just reflecting now, but since Dhamma is um, in my life, life became easier, easier, much easier to deal with any difficulties and deal with people, being truthful to your, myself, like kind of easy to deal with different people, even difficult people. Then before, I think that many people like telling lies or something because they are afraid. And when Dhamma is in your life, you are not afraid. So it's much much easier somehow. It's, life is lighter. Yeah. I feel like that in many difficult situations. Yeah. You, I might be frustrated, but I feel that it's easier to deal with any problems mm. in my life. This Super. Mm-hmm. Concrete benefit. Yeah. 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 Like so actually, this is kind of confidence. Yeah. I feel that going through life is much easier. Super. Yeah, I resonate where you say that it's easier to um, deal with different situations and that not so much fear. I think that's yeah. for me because if I consider the situation I'm in now compared to the past, of course, it was far more meditative. I could be peaceful and equanimous to almost everything because I was meditating all day long, but the challenges were nowhere near as big. And I think, you know, learning that whatever, however, this thing, this five candles is manifesting is nothing to do with me. It's the result of the conditions I'm in gives me a lot more confidence to be to allow that to be if I'm stressed or if I'm a bit kind of don't have the capacity to deal with one more question it's not a personal issue and it's not Mm. so worried about what other people think because I know that anyone in this situation would be the same and in that sense it gives me much more confidence to kind of stretch into areas that would be 
impossible to conceive of previously. <laughs> yeah. 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 Less fear of judgment, I think. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah. Anyone else? It's so inspiring to hear all these reflections. What does the Dhamma mean to you? How has it helped you? What does confidence and inspiration mean? Where does it come from? When do you feel inspired? Or any other question you'd like to talk about? Hey, come in. Can you unmute? Not yet? Okay, I'm going to go to Sunai. Oh, you've done it. Okay. I've Hi, done it. Hi. Thank you. Um, it's just building on from what you've just said in, in our group with um, Terry and Tristan. Um, we agreed that this the sense of anxiety that we often have in our lives, sometimes, you know, for for very, um, anxiety is all, always valid, but yeah, some, some really big things might be happening. Um, and then to be able to connect again with that sense of safety in ourselves that being connected to the Dharma gives you. It, it fills a vacuum which we might have carried before. And then, um, Terry, I hope you don't mind me sharing this wonderful image. It's not like a construct, like a like a um, uh, like scaffolding that we sometimes may hold on to. It's actually it it goes inside. It's it's like. I absorb it. Terry was saying, you know, it's it's a process of gentle, almost unnoticeable absorption, mm. and there it is inside that that knowledge. Mm. And to remind yourself of that that state when you're pulled out of it through the anxiety or through stress or anger, to somehow just come back in and just connect to that not a clunky thing but just that very quiet soft mm. knowing beautiful. And, and that is so safe mm. that's really beautiful so that constant dance you know com yeah. coming back right. Right. Thank, thank you for everything and thank, thank you for the community thank you for sharing in fact, that just reminds me that that can be considered a kind of dhammanusati. It's a kind of reflection on the dhamma, like bringing up the qualities of the dhamma, the sense of safety, the sense of confidence, mm -hmm. the sense of peace or kindness, whatever it is, and actually embodying that feeling again at the times you most need to, you know, actually putting your mind back into that context where you felt safe, what it meant, who was there, how did it feel as an embodied experience? This is a way that we can encourage the mind to go there again and again. Embodied, embodiment. Embodied, yeah. That's, yeah. that's exactly it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. We get to hear from our Indian friend, Sanayana. Hi. Hey, Manjabu, how are you? It's so nice to see you again. Um, <laughs> um, well, something that... Uh, came to my mind right now uh is um <clears throat> like uh like everybody's been saying it's uh definitely um a uh safety net I feel um because whenever um I've I've noticed whenever I'm um especially like struggling or or sad I've always like found um it really comforting to listen to the Dhamma um and that's when I've always felt very motivated to practice. Um, and like a couple of months back, um, I think like till a couple of months back, um, I was like really into like, I, I would, I would, I would like talk, um, think about the Dhamma all the time. That's the only thing I wanted to talk about. But then, but then um, there were like several months after that, when I felt like I wasn't doing anything. I was, I just like, yeah, I, I was like, um slacking off pretty much um but there was always like a part of me that felt okay I should be you know um doing a lot more um but the the beautiful uh thing is that um recently I um 
reached out to uh, one of um, my um, Dhamma friends and I was like, hey, you know, I should really be practicing more. And and she was like, oh, OK, um, you know, just tell me how I can support you. And it was just a very simple, sweet gesture. But, but it, it, um, it's just it's nice knowing that um, it is like a hard path, but it's it's nice that, you know, um, it's always there to sort of like for you for for us to for me to fall back onto you know there might be times when um i'm not um using my time really wisely but then i can always come back to the teachings and like the like the teachings are there and then the the sangha is there and it's just it's really inspiring and beautiful I think, you know, just to, because it's life can be really messy otherwise, but then knowing that that's it's always there to sort of like guide me. I think that's, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, there to come back to at any time. And the funny thing is, it's not there outside, it's there inside, right? We can think, oh, it's there outside in the Sangha, in the suttas, but actually once you started on this path, it's actually inside. I think it's hard for people to fall off the path once they've got a bit of confidence, even if you don't practice for a long time, even if you think you've gone off track. I just think there's nothing comparable to the Dhamma. So eventually you're going to come back. You know? You're just going to come back. You can't forget it once you've tasted the Dhamma, even a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think that's kind of almost... Coming to a close, not yet though, because the best part is soon. Um, so I'm going to have Manoi say a few words about the project and our monastery and maybe how you can get involved um, for the next five minutes. And after that, there's an opportunity for people to actually um, take the refuges and precepts if you want to. So this is something we do traditionally at the uh, Vesak celebrations and sometimes uh, every two weeks on the Apostata days. Uh, the full moon days, the half moon days, and the, the no moon days. And uh, or is it just the full moon and the no moon days? Sometimes it's every week in Buddhist countries. Um, and this is optional, but it's something that can be quite uplifting. So I'll explain a little bit about that. After. So, Monoe, would you like to um, come right in between? <laughs> She's actually this side of the spoon. <laughs> so we're very happy about that. <laughs> Hello. So um I hope you know a little bit of Anukampa project Bikuni project by now, but I will kind of give a gist of it. Verbal Chanda started it, I think single-handedly, um, without without any help um about eight years ago. She came from Australia and um, she didn't know how to do, you know, a company or charity. And, you know, how does how does it work in UK and where can she go? That you know, from that time, from that level up to now, we've come a long way. And um, I'm very grateful for Venerable Chanda to uh, be persistent and be confident in the Dhamma the Dhamma Sangha, and here we are, and we have now Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. We have uh, we have a lovely monastery in the Oxford. I, I hope all of you will be able to come one day and see how it is and participate in one of these things personally as well. Um, and we, have, we are a charity in the UK, and we have a huge community, as you can see, all over the world, um, and uh, we have regular teachings um, in our website. You can see uh, we have a schedule of regular teachings, um, uh, Wednesday chanting, um, Friday sutta discussions, and then silent meditations on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Saturdays, we have um, med uh, metta meditation, and when Virabha Chanda goes on WhatsApp, we have we have had for a couple of years um, so many other bikunis. It is a very rare chance. I've never had such a chance um, coming from a Buddhist country. Um, this is the first chance I had, you know, teachings of so many bikunis 
uh, during the Vasa. So um, I'm very grateful personally, and I'm sure all of you might be having so many different values uh, from our Kampa Bikuni project. So the project, uh, we are in a big um, uh, big place now, I think, in the project wise, we are quite stable, but we can't do it without you. We can't do it without the community. And um, uh, all of us rallying around this. Uh, so we came to this new monastery from uh, from a smaller terrace house, um, and we are still settling down. We are still we haven't sold the other house yet, so we are still um, getting the plumbers and all kinds of things. You know, you know when you go into a new house, but when you go into a new monastery, changing a house into a monastery is such a big work, uh, and uh, this. Monastery has given much more space than the previous monastery building, and it has given Venerable Chanda opportunity um, for you know physical space to train um, as other bhikkhunis, future monasteries, future bhikkhunis, and also um, as we have here today, we have uh, other bhikkhunis visiting, um, and and. So yeah, Samaneri, and there's there is Verbal uh, and and one Samaneri from USA. And um, so we got so many visitors coming and the lay people coming, the people who want to become, um, you know, explore this path, come and stay and see how is living in a monastery, how how is that feels for me. So there's so many things we offer. Uh, so um to we can't do it without the community. We can't do it without the generosity of all of us. And I would gratefully ask you, if you are able financially, um, if, if you can make a financial donation that in Buddhist we call a dana, and in Anukampa Bikuni project, uh, there is a page for that, Anukampa Bikuni project slash donate. It is in the chat box. Um, and you can, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it is a big amount or small amount, whatever you can. And also, if you can, if you are able to do a standing order, that is gratefully received as well. Um, uh, so oh, um, that is financial, which is, which is very important at this juncture of, of the project. And if you want to get involved in other ways, that it's it's all in detail uh, in the in the uh, website. Um, there is if if you want to come, if you want to do a physical dana, that is a food donation, you can email team at anukampaproject.org and discuss with them. Find the find the times and days that can be done. Even you can do it remotely. And also, if you want to find exactly what are the needed items, I don't want to give something which is not useful. There's a needed items list as well in the website. And uh, so I hope you will get involved and um, uh, be part of the community and uh, um, make this grow for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> And thanks to Minori, she's our treasurer, actually, and she's fantastic. She's doing such a great job. And we've also got Alina here as well, behind the scenes, who really is mainly responsible for putting this house sale through, for actually doing all the kind of legal and logistical um, nitty-gritty paperwork behind the scenes. And it's just amazing that we have such dedicated people around us you know some of you are local some of you on this group many of you have come to stay many of you have been to my retreats and other retreats and uh, it's just heartwarming and the other thing that we really would like to uh, invite you to do is come and spend some time even if you are from overseas just spend a week or longer if you wish and uh, and just practice with us because the monastery offers something that's different from a retreat center a retreat center is something that's far removed from daily life. You have almost perfect conditions, pretty much no distractions, and very few triggers. A lot of inner work, but very few external triggers. And in a monastery, it's different. You have to learn to live with others, cooperate, live in harmony, try to understand different people, different ways. 
and also practice right speech. So we have this beautiful um, balance between service and solitude, which I think is really a special uh, attribute of a monastery. You know, you will get solitude, time for practice on your own, um, and some of the teachings as well like this and uh, the other groups that we do. So um, what I really feel happy about with this whole project is just the building of community, but also offering the complete Eightfold Path, not just retreats that are then sometimes difficult to integrate, but a kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle of practice. And of course, that opportunity for women who develop the aspiration, which is a gradual development. It's something that sometimes we don't expect to happen. Um, but at some point for me anyway, there was no other choice, you know, it was just, it just felt like the only possible way to continue because I just wasn't interested in the things of the world. You know, there's no real interest in, in coming back to all that. And uh, knowing that this was an option, being in Asia at that time, it was a remote and a difficult option, but still there was a chance. And it took me 10 years to find a place, you know, 10 years, not just, oh, it'd be nice someday, but concerted looking and working towards that, serving on hundreds of retreats actually sitting and serving on over 120 or something crazy just developing myself in the dhamma serving and uh, keeping my ears and eyes open and uh, that's why I'm passionate about doing something here because often we can find a place in another country but at some point there's a visa issue or there's a stomach issue in my case there were both actually and uh, just to be able to practice in one's own cultural setting and also bring something of the dhamma back to a land where it's very hard to find, you know. Um, and the Buddha said that the Bhikkhuni Sangha is absolutely necessary for the long-term um, strength and um, continuation of the Dhamma. You know, we need people um, from every community, not just the male and female community either, but gender non-binary folks, transgender folks, all kinds of people, as many as possible, to represent the Dhamma in their own unique way. And uh, this is why we're really keen to make a very inclusive community that um, hopefully you can feel that you belong and you can feel that safety and a sense of um, spiritual friendship that can really support you on the path. So, um, yeah, you can write to the team at as well if you want to come and stay. Uh, actually, there's not much more space now. There's like literally one little slot until the rains retreat and then... Yeah, it'll be a bit of a pause while I have my own retreat time. But um, next year, we'll really get into this <laughs> and start having more happening at the monastery too. So, uh, yeah, some of you here have actually applied for next year already. So please feel free to do that as well. OK, so for the last 10 minutes, there's not a lot of time. I wanted to offer an opportunity for those who wish to uh, take the refuges and precepts. And what I want to say with that is that this is something very beautiful, very uplifting. It's a, um, a kind of um, commitment that we make to recognize that there's something much higher, more noble, more beautiful than what we know right now, and that we can aspire to that. We can take refuge in the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and that will help to grow them within ourselves. And so uh, we take the refuges, not in any person, but in our own capacity to develop the Dhamma within ourselves and to um, really start living with more compassion and wisdom and to make a commitment to that. And uh, it's important to say that, you know, the precepts, taking the precepts is not putting yourself in a straight jacket. It's not only about restraint. We undertake the training to refrain from certain actions that are harmful and that cause um, pain to ourselves and other beings. And we commit to living a life of harmlessness, a life of um, honesty, truthfulness, nonviolence. Um, it's actually an active thing as well. And you don't have to be perfect to take the precepts. There is no danger in messing up because it's a training that we can go back to at any time. So it's not as though if you make a mistake, you're no longer training in the precepts. You just admit the mistake to yourself and try again and again and again. And we just constantly refine our understanding and uh, constantly just keep on 
bringing up through wisdom the importance of trying to be kind, right? Kindness is at the heart of everything. And if our motivation is one of loving kindness, then our actions of body and speech are likely to follow in that direction. And in a way, it's those, those precepts are sort of manifestations of love, right? Love is something we have to actually do. And one of the ways is to use our speech, use our bodily action in a wise way to bring happiness to ourselves and other people. So um, what we usually do is uh, pay respects to the Buddha and then we uh, take the refuges. And then I'm going to offer the five precepts because there's not a lot of time. And I think five precepts is realistic. It's already uh, late afternoon. Many of you might be looking forward to dinner or you've had dinner or something already. Um, so I'm going to offer the five precepts. And uh, I'll say what each one means in English before we actually take it. So in the beginning, we're going to pay respects to the Buddha, Namo Tassa, and then um, take refuge in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. That means the qualities of those. So you can repeat after me from the comfort of your home, if you wish. And uh, otherwise, just listen in. <clears throat> So I'll recite Namo Tassa three times and then you can recite it three times, okay? Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. So you can chant along with Renu Blue Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Oh, for them to say it with you. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami Dutiyam Pi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyam Pi Buddham Saranam Gachami Dutiyam Pi Dhamham Saranam Gachami Dutiyam Pi Dhamham Saranam Gachami Dutiyam Pi Sangham Saranam Gachami Dutiyam Pi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam Pi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam Pi Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam Pi Dhamham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam Pi Dhamham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam Pi Sangham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam Pi Sangham Saranam Gachami Ti Sarana Gamana Nititam So now I'm going to offer oh, the five. Oh, great. Matthias has put the words up. Wow, wonderful. Okay, so the next one means I undertake the training to abstain from killing living beings. So everybody can repeat after me. You can do it along with Venerable Lupeka. 
Panati pata vedamani sikha patam samadhyami. Panati pata vedamani sikha patam samadhyami. The next one is I undertake the training to abstain from taking what is not given. Adina dana we ramani sikha padam samadhi ami. Adina dana we ramani sikha padam samadhi ami. The next one, I undertake the training to abstain from sexual misconduct. Kame sumitcha chara we ramani sikha padam Samadhi Ami Kame Sumichachara Vedamani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami And then I undertake the training to abstain from false speech. Musavada Vedamani Sikapadam Samadhi Ami Musavada Vedamani Sikapadam Samadhi Ami. And lastly, I undertake the training. This is hard for people in the West. <laughs> so let's say abstain or reduce as much as you possibly can to abstain from alcoholic drink and drugs that cloud the mind and cause heedlessness. Sura Mireya Madja Pamaratana Vedamani Sikapatam Samadhi Ami Sura Mireya Madja Pamaratana Vedamani Sikapatam Samadhi Ami Imani Pancha Sikapatani Silena Sugatim Yanti Silena Boga Sampada Silena Nibutim Yanti Tasma Silam Vasodaye Which means these are those five precepts which may you train in for your own happiness, prosperity and for the sake of Nibbana. Keeping your sila ever pure. The word visodaya means pure. That's my second name, Chanda Visuddhi. So it's the same name, Visuddhi Visoda. Hey, okay, so as best we can, we undertake to train in these precepts and hold them above our head as some precious jewels that you wouldn't want to drop. And there comes a point in the path where one would not knowingly break these precepts even at the risk of one's life. So this is how precious they are. They are the foundation for the practice. They are the foundation for really strong samadhi. The samadhi that's based on sila is of great fruit and great benefit, so said the Buddha. And as a result of that samadhi, that stillness, that uh, unity of mind, again and again and again, overcoming those hindrances, we have the opportunity to see things as they really are, to see the Dhamma that the Buddha himself saw and broke through to. We too can do that. So you've taken many steps today, hopefully in inspiring yourself, gaining more confidence in the path and uh, establishing a feeling of community and spiritual friendship and also um, committing to practice a life of harmlessness and uh, to continue practicing however you can. So we've come to the end of today. And uh, once again, I'd like to really thank everybody. And Vedan Budapeka as well, do you have any final words for anyone? Or... I think it comes to mind. I think we probably said everything there is to say. And uh, just wish you really, really well. So let's unmute everybody. Also, thank you to our co-host, Matthias, who's always absolutely brilliant in his kind of calm and steady presence and recording everything so we can watch it again at any time. And uh, all the links that you've added as well. Uh, yes, please feel free to type in the chat your goodbyes and uh, hopefully see you somewhere soon. So. Let's unmute and we can all say goodbye.